Greetings from Chennai Center for China Studies. A warm welcome to you all to the latest edition of C3's podcast. In this episode, we will be looking at the Chinese influence operations. China has been extending its influence in every nook and corner of the world by means of different tools. Moving away from the traditional warfare, China reportedly is being able to infiltrate into the societies and decision-making mechanisms of other countries in a discreet manner. In the recent past, India has also witnessed these covert operations by China. Hence, it is vital for us to have a deeper understanding of these influence operations that are being carried out by India's neighbor. Hi, I'm Sapna Elsa Ibrahim, Research Officer, Chennai Center for China Studies. For today's discussion, we have here with us Mr. Tanvi Jayakishan. Mr. Tanvi Jayakishan is the Chief Operations Officer of Red Kangaroo Health Private Limited and a distinguished member of C3S. A very warm welcome to you, sir, to the podcast. Thank you, Sapna. Thank you for having me. So diving straight into the interview, um, in the recent past, uh, we have come across many reports of the increased intervention of China in the decision-making organs of different countries. Be the report of the funding um, um, of China to the Rajapaksha's political campaign in Sri Lanka, to the um, reports of Chinese agent at the Parliament of United Kingdom, and recently uh, the controversy that is happening in Australia regarding the foreign intervention um, in the upcoming Australian elections. So, uh, giving an idea to the audience, what is an what are influence operations? And uh, what is the extent of these influence operations that are carried out by China in the international arena? That's a good question. And I think that's very topical and relevant for the geopolitical landscape that we are witnessing today. And what we're seeing, uh, Sapna, is that we're moving away from a bipolar world to a multipolar world, one with uh, different sort of power centers. We're seeing a new sort of Cold War emerging uh, with the recent Russia-Ukraine war in place. We're seeing a proxy war being played out in Ukraine. And um, the world after the war with Ukraine is going to be very different. And every country needs to wake up to the new geopolitical realities and take stock accordingly. But fundamentally, what are influence operations? Influence operations is operations launched by a nation state, either directly by the government itself or by individuals affiliated to the state or by uh, local entities within the targeted state to bring about favorable behavior towards that foreign state, right? Now, the best example of an influence operation would be, for example, the interference of Russia in the uh, election, uh, the US election of, uh, of 2016. Now, that was a classic example of active measures, as the KGB would call it, in this posing. The use of social media to actually drive a wedge between people and their government to make people trust their government less and more importantly to increase the divide within a society now obviously if you take a country like america you have your conservatives you have your liberals with their political divides but what i think the russians did very successfully through their disinformation campaigns is to actually grow these divides into chasms which are now very difficult to bridge so this is a classic example of an information operation. It's basically disinformation. It's, as you said, very clearly uh, in bribing of politicians by investing in their political campaigns, uh, placing agents in parliament. And right now we're seeing a defense pact being signed in Solomon Islands uh, of Australia, which presents a huge geopolitical security challenge to Australia, to the Indo-Pacific and even to the Quad. So these are clear cases of influence operations. And what we see is that democracies are usually the most vulnerable to such influence operations because, especially Western liberal democracies, simply because there is a huge emphasis on freedom of speech. There's a huge emphasis on not on muzzling uh, speech on social media. And as a result of that, there is the amount of debate that takes place in, these, in social media in these sort of public spaces is intense. And with so much scope for debate and disagreement, there is a ripe opportunity to actually spread misinformation and disinformation in order to, in, to grow the divides uh, within a society and disproportionately favor a particular political candidate or a group of people that are friendly towards the country that is creating this sort of information operation. 
Now, these information operations does not have to be as malicious or insidious. Uh, it can also be soft power and diplomacy, all right? Basic soft power. You take the US, for example. The US has incredible soft power through uh, its culture, its art, Hollywood, uh, Netflix, OTT. We globally, we watch a lot of American content and, and it's why we are led or we continue to be led by an America, American-centric sort of uh, US-centric worldview. And why we continue to, uh, why most nations continue to give the US a hall pass or a free pass for uh, some of the things it's done. Whereas, you know, if the Russians or the Chinese were to do the same things, we tend to be more accusative. So it's again the use of cultural power, the use of soft power. Even India, to a certain extent, has a huge amount of soft power potential in terms of our Bollywood, in terms of our cultural exports and so on and so forth. It's just that we don't leverage it as much or we've now started to leverage that sort of soft power. So information operations isn't simply cyber. It isn't simply a bunch of troll farms on social media. It isn't just a bunch of bots pushing the propaganda and the narrative of, uh, of, of a particular political candidate that's friendly towards that nation. It's a whole host of um, hybridized warfare that's been played out across multiple domains. It's information warfare, it's disinformation, it's smear campaigns, it's uh, bribery, it's, it's infiltration and so on and so forth. And I would say in my opinion that China hasn't been as successful with its information operations in the West as say a country like Russia has. Simply, and then the best litmus test has been COVID-19 and the response to COVID-19 if you think about it. Now after COVID, once it was ascertained that COVID broke out from Wuhan, Right, and once the prevailing consensus was that it broke out of Wuhan, what we saw is that instead of China playing out a disinformation campaign, biding its time, playing its slopes, you know, actually seeding doubts in minds of countries through social media, they went on a full wolf warrior offensive, saying that no, no, it wasn't Wuhan, it was Italy, it was India, it was the US military, and they sort of lashed out. Uh, so that was again a very poor use of, uh, of, of, of information warfare, that was a very poor use of its influence. And uh, whereas a country would, like Russia would have handled it very differently, a country like Russia would have, if, if Russia was in that position, it would have used sort of social media to very inorganically, or very organically rather spread a narrative to plant doubt, enough doubt to question the official narrative, right? So uh, when we think of information, I mean, when we think of influence operations, we must also not limit ourselves to influence operations in, uh, in from one state to another. We need to look at influential operations in, in multilateral institutions. Right? And I think this is where China has a huge um, lead in, its, in, in the number of international in, multilateral institutions, international institutions that it runs, that it, that, is, that it chairs, that it is a deputy chair. And we'll come to that subsequently. But what I think China has done wonderfully well in its trade craft and its real politics is that it has really pursued influence in these in, uh, multilateral institutions, these development agencies, giving them a huge amount of say and leverage in terms of where money goes, what projects are funded, what projects are not funded, giving them a lot of indirect power over smaller countries that actually require this development grant, right? And this huge sort of behind the scenes indirect power is I think where China has its ultimate strength. But as I said, we will come, up, come to this in a little more detail as we go through the um, uh, interview. Yes, sir. Um, so, so you mentioned about um, US even how US has um, its influence over other countries. Um, so yes. many country, many powerful countries in the world over the past, yes. and um, it still continue, continue to use these right. tools to right. exercise right. their influence in the international arena. But right. what are the factors that make uh, the influence operations by China to be viewed as a grave threat to a nation? See, again, what the Chinese do very well through the, is that the they leverage that they use in their influence operations is trade and economics, right? Now, if you look, most countries um, have China as their largest trading partner. And China has invested uh, huge amounts of capital over the last two, three decades since coming into the World Trade Organization, since sort of being integrated into the global supply chains to make themselves indispensable to a whole bunch of countries around the world for supply of raw materials, for supply of finished products, right? And that obviously is a huge amount of leverage. I mean, you take, for example, uh, what did the, the, the Australia-China spat, right? The moment that Australia called for an independent verification into the outbreak, China immediately launched an embargo on a whole host of Australian products, forcing Australia to look for alternate markets. 
and it's done so quietly with a whole bunch of other countries that have tried to stay out of line. In fact, the recently concluded Regional Comprehensive Economic Program, the RCEP, the trade deal with 15 uh, Asian nations, is a huge sort of uh, shot in the arm for China in terms of controlling the flow of trade and goods and capital to its favor to these in the smaller nations. And as a result of that, a lot of these smaller nations in Asia who went through devastating COVID waves didn't have a word to say in criticism of China because they, they were afraid of what would happen if, they, if China decided to turn off the tap, stop exporting goods and stop receiving goods from these countries. Also, we have to understand that China has a very powerful and a potent uh, weapon up its sleeve, and that's the Belt and Road Initiative, right? Now, China has agreements with over 140 countries. And what we can say very frankly is we do what we know about the BRI and uh, these projects is dwarfed by what we don't know. We, we don't know what we, a lot more than what we know if you understand and because uh, it all has to do, deal with the contracting and the clauses and a lot of this contracting and clauses are done in secrecy in fact if you look at the uh, china pakistan economic corridor which is a white elephant what pakistan now is trying to do is it's trying to approach the imf for loans and, and sort of bailouts but for that the imf has told pakistan look why don't you share with us the contractual obligations you have with the chinese and you're not willing to do so and as we go in we will unlock We'll discuss some of these contracts, how opaque they are, how insidious they are, and how they malicious they are for the country where these projects are being developed, especially for these poorer African nations who end up being in massive debt because of these projects. And that's a sort of tool, a weapon that a country like China uses. China is not so much uh, so, doesn't so much focus on social media in so much as it uses trade as a weapon to exert a huge amount of influence. Uh, you look at COVID-19, for example, right? and you look at, look at China's impact on the multilateral on multilateral institutions. When COVID-19 broke out, up till January or February of 2020, the World Health Organization was saying there is no proof that this is transmissible from human being to human being. In fact, there's a very famous tweet that was put out in January. And we all know that the current uh, World Health Organization head, uh, Dr. Gibbizis, if I'm pronouncing it right, is a China-backed candidate. And while one of the countries that did a phenomenal job in the earlier stages was Taiwan, not only were they able to contain the outbreak, they were able to, they were in a position where they actually were ready to help people, help other countries supplying masks. There was no vaccines back then, but supplying masks, PPEs, essential equipment. And China made sure that Taiwan was completely blocked at any uh, forum or sub forum within the World Health Organization. So even during a national, an international pandemic, a global pandemic, you had China being able to exert its influence very indirectly in this multilateral institution, this very important multilateral institution to ensure that its goals, its geopolitical goals were not compromised. So uh, what do you say? When we think of information operations in China, we have to not look at it in terms of social media but we or, or, or hybrid warfare, but we have to look at it in terms of trade and economics. So when it comes to India, we have to look at the social media aspect of it within the lens of uh, the recent uh, border incursions, right? And, and, and the China's use of hybridized warfare and information warfare and psychological warfare to influence Indian response and Indian thinking. But as we go through it, we will sort of look into this sort of uh, subsection a little bit more. So uh, coming into the economic tool that um, China uses, uh, yes. the BRI, for example. Right. Um, right. They, they have been facing a lot of backlashes in even uh, countries that are allies to China, like Pakistan and now mm. Sri Lanka. For the right. How much of an impact uh, will these backlashes and challenges that uh, China's BRI faces in um, other countries on the Chinese influence across the world? Like, will it have a very uh, bad uh, effect on it in the future? Um, how is it going to be so? Okay, this is very interesting because when we think about the BRI, everybody thinks about the money and the a percentage of interest and the amount of debt that has to be repaired. Ultimately, it becomes about, okay, this country owes 10% of its GDP, this country owes $50 billion. But when we think of the BRI, we have to look at how these BRI contracts are structured. And this is fantastic report, I think, by the Center for Development uh, on how China lends. Basically, what they were able to do is they actually study they were able to get access to about a hundred of these so-called bri contracts of an estimated 2000 signed and they especially focused on contracts that were signed after 2014 
and if you look at the way that these contracts are structured the ramifications go far beyond just debt so what some of these contracts essentially state is let's say china is lending to country x country x may be obligated to open a bank account in a chinese bank it may be the same chinese bank that's lending the money so that the proceeds or the profits for the product for the project that is being created goes and sits into that chinese bank account the profits are not kept in that country but it's kept in that chinese bank account number 2 china advertises the bri as a job as an opportunity for local jobs but what a lot of countries have complained is that the these companies actually executing the projects on the ground end up importing uh, cheap chinese labor and the use of local workers are very nominal so there's no sort of uh, uh, that that benefit of jobs being created goes out the window number 3 these clauses are the, the the clauses and sub clauses in these contracts are also very malicious because these clause, there are clauses that state that the host country cannot speak out against china in any unilateral or multilateral forum in any condition and if these countries do speak out then china has a right to uh, ask for the entire debt to be paid back instantly with interest right and that's obviously not doable for a lot of these countries so what happens is if china were to go to war or if china was something was to do something bad on the world stage by virtue of the way these contracts are structured a lot of these countries are bullied into silence and bullied into not speaking out at all so it's not simply about the debt and how big the debt is and there are other clauses and sub clauses that are also quite insidious right um, there are clauses that state that if this pro- if the country is in question is not able to pay back the debt within a certain time frame then china has the right to sort of na- take over the entire project and that impinges on national sovereignty right like take for example the humban tota port that we is, is a known example of china taking it over on a 99 year lease because sri lanka was not able to pay back the debt but these sort of sub clauses are present in hundreds of contracts or hundreds of these bri contracts and a lot of these contracts have very strict non disclosure clauses which means that countries seeking loans from other multilateral institutions like the imf world bank cannot legally disclose these contracts to the imf or the world bank or any of these multilateral institutions when asking for a loan so these are inherently un- unfair contracts not only in terms of debt repayment but in terms of keeping these countries in line and keeping these countries in check now if you look at what's happening in russia and ukraine you find that the world has gone out and condemned russia because the amount of economic linkage between russia and several countries is limited but with china it's not the case so if china were to go to war with with taiwan or if china were to go to war with india you would find that a lot of these countries would keep mum simply because of their bri obligations out of fear that the is the chinese may enforce these obligations and say look we want our money back in fact a lot of these contracts say that the arbitration will only happen in a chinese court right and that they will not accept an international court ruling and uh, 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 or what do you see so a lot of these smaller countries african countries latin american countries have no choice but to stay in line so the bri is an enormous source of influence uh, at least for countries that do not have the ability to to pay back and obviously there are very severe geo strategic implications because if you look at countries like somalia which obviously uh, cannot pay back its debt china has instead gone and said you we're building you a naval station let us use it as a base to monitor our trade coming out of the straits of hormuz so we actually have a nice naval base which is very quite close to a american base camp lemonie so this is how it works either it buys you or bribes you into submission and when you can't pay up it it takes over the asset or the project in question and then uses it for its own purposes it can be military it can be civil it could be both so i think that um, if and, and i and i understand that america and the rest of the is trying to come up come back with a build back better program right to try and counter the chinese bri the question is not so much building projects the last thing countries want is 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 building hospitals and building schools it is important but more importantly if the build back pro- better program has to work it has to help these countries escape from these sort of very legally binding very strict contracts and and, and it's also what uh, i think where the china where china succeeds is china is is not so worried about human rights and and so on and so forth it doesn't care about a country's human rights as a god when it comes to another country it doesn't lecture on human rights uh, but when, uh, when when the west does they they do have a tendency to wag their finger and talk about human rights which is led to a lot of countries saying when china comes they don't come and lecture us they come they build schools they build hospitals 
when the west come they come very condescendingly and wag fingers at us which is why a lot of these countries are initially sort of seduced into going with the chinese to and if you look at it if you look at how the bri is structured it's it's like it's it's how a cocaine dealer sells cocaine with you I'll tell you bluntly that's the best analogy the first time somebody wants to sell you cocaine they give you free so you get addicted to it then the cost goes up and up and up and up and by then you're so addicted you're selling things in the house just to keep the habit going so this is how china works they start with something free can we build you a hospital can we build you a school this is a gift from the chinese people oh hey by the way it would be better if you have a nice railway connecting point a and point b we'd be happy to fund the project would you be interested and a lot of these governments all of these politicians obviously need to show that they're doing something for their people and they're happy to sign on the dotted lines so, so that they can show that look I am a pro development prime minister I'm a pro development president I'm a pro development dictator or a pro development autocrat and and this is where the sort of slide begins so that so China has actually mastered the ability to appeal to these smaller countries clutching them not just in debt but also in terms of a um a vice by which they can't even speak out even if injustice is being done to them for fear of these repercussions and reprisals so that is how they have their influence operations through the BRI um so coming to the uh, domestic front mm -hmm. will you be able to throw some light into how china is um, china has its influence over india see we have to look at uh, with, uh, with china's effect on india is four for one is trade right and obviously this post ladakh post galwan bilateral trade has actually gone up between the two countries Uh, and the trade imbalance between the two countries in china's favor has actually increased so ultimately what china has realized is that nationalism stops at the wallet it's all good saying you know china hi hi but nationalism stops at the pocket ultimately if you have to choose between an apple an expensive apple phone or an expensive samsung phone or a, or a relatively cheap redmi which provides you the same features you're going to buy the redmi or the one plus which is maybe cost half the price but gives you the same quality so they understand that well and uh, what do you say i feel that what the government of india has done is is not move fast enough in in incentivizing manufacturing and performance links linked incentives which is why this is, and and more importantly it's not really looked at lowering import tariffs for a lot of essential ingredients essential products which is why india is still devil heavily devil uh, dependent on china for apis we may be the pharmacy of the world but 70% of the raw materials for the pharmacy for the for the So the medicines that we make come from China, and India has not really done a lot to move away from that. And it's moving, but it's moving in a very sort of piecemeal manner. So obviously, trade is a huge leverage. That's number one. Now, India has done is smart to ban a, a whole bunch of apps and has restricted China's uh, uh, what do you say investments in the tech sector. But the Chinese have also found a way around that. Instead of in, in, you know investing directly in China, they've opened up offices in Singapore, right, and other third countries, and are then investing. so where there's a will there's a way there are a lot of chinese uh, entrepreneurs who are still very bullish about india and india's growth that they're willing to go through these sort of circuitous processes just to invest so that again is a deterrent but it's not going to be a very effective deterrent the third is cyber warfare and i think this is where china has uh, india has held its resolve we've, we've seen articles i think there was one by the new york times where the chinese hackers actually targeted the power grid in mumbai uh, or maharashtra right after galwan as a warning and again more recently there was an article that china has been targeting the power grids in ladakh maybe to just test the vulnerabilities maybe as a pretext to an invasion to see how they can cripple uh, a power grid before moving in so obviously there is a, a persistent cyber war warfare campaign that is being launched against india to test for vulnerabilities probe for weaknesses and uh, more importantly send a message that we can destabilize you whenever we want now what i understand from from reading a lot of articles on cyber security and i'm not ex i'm no expert and i can't really be too technical about this is that while china has a very powerful sword arm or a cyber sword arm its shield arm still remains relatively weak that is they have they've invested quite heavily in offensive cyber capabilities but their defensive cyber capabilities are still lacking now obviously i i would like to believe that a lot of these attacks aren't going unpunished that there is retaliatory cyber attacks taking place but india has a strategic culture where we don't talk about obviously we cannot and we should not talk about these actions right we don't claim responsibility 
and china is a totalitarian state ultimately it controls the news you know it doesn't just control the news it controls what you can post on social media if there is a hashtag that's out of place all the tweets or all the posts delete, attached to that hashtag is deleted all the posts with that particular word in it is deleted immediately so even if there was a cyber attack and even if it was being trending or even being talked about on a weibo or or any chinese platform the ccp can bring down entire threads within seconds so even if there was a very successful cyber attack being conducted and even if chinese netizens were talking about it the chinese have the ability to actually stop the conversation entirely so we don't know india's retaliatory capacity and how it's retaliated uh, tit for tat in such scenarios but i think what india needs to make clear and i think what the uk has done is very clearly said that look we will use nuclear weapons if our if our if if cyber attacks are done in such a way that civilian lives are put at risk if cyber attacks are done in which there is a mass casualty civilian event we will constitute it an act of war and we will even use our nukes so what india needs to do is to come up with the policies that says that look a, a cyber attack that is so crippling and so damaging that can cause serious loss of life is an act of war and to classify it would bring about a sea change in, in strategic thinking and i think that's long overdue now in terms of informationized warfare uh, china has actually been employing it very well from uh, what they have done post galwan they have shown pictures of uh, indian pows every time there is a disengagement there was a disengagement at pangong so there was a disengagement at hot springs and while the disengagement was happening uh, the chinese bots on twitter would publish these images of indian soldiers bloodied and beaten up and with their hands tied and holding up their military car there's a way of saying look we have beaten you to a pulp and we're being nice to you right and unfortunately india has this sort of a strategic culture of retaliating at least in the information warfare space and that goes a lot deeper because post yuri the indian establishment did not share any footage of the surgical strike post balkot india did not share any footage of these uh, terror camps being destroyed the us does it the us does it very happily whatever it blows up it likes to process they they are very pro see 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 we blew this up see 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 how beautiful our drones are because when they do they're sending a message we will get you wherever you are we are all powerful resistance is futile why are you bothered we will get you. you there's no place that you can call home no place is safe for you these are our beautiful drones these are our beautiful missiles and those are your corpses but india does not have this strategic culture so we have the tools to play the same iw game it's just that there is no political will and i think the strategic culture is about opaqueness and and playing it close to the west right even rajnath singh very recently in a, in a speech he said i can't tell you what the boys have done but they have done such things that have kept the chinese in check so obviously the culture is it's not so much the tools the tools exist but i think it's the strategic culture the political military culture of this point or the strategic culture is to sort of play things close to the west and not the uh, reveal your hand because again let's understand that there is a huge disparity military disparity between the two nations and india is in not in any place to to be indulging in any smack talk at this point at least not for a while until we try to bring that gap to bridge that gap in parity uh so the, so the chinese and 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 if this is lovely i think report that uh, it's available online it's it's published by the us army war college on uh, chinese combat tactics basically they've studied pla combat manuals to try and understand how the pla would actually conduct a war and essentially what the pla has done is they have broken down their striking elements into combined arms brigades and combined arms battalions and both of these brigades and battalions are equipped with electronic warfare and information warfare cells so the idea of these information warfare cells is to actually capture real time footage of the battle send it back to the iw uh, what do you say command and control center and then publish these images so there was a war in ladakh for example and and the chinese were able to block a few indian tanks or take out an indian uh, base images of that would be sent edited by these iw cells and then plastered all over social media to say look we are decimating you on the battlefield so information warfare and electronic warfare is a part of their what do you say tactical battalion level brigade level planning and i don't know how much of information warfare or uh, is is embedded in the indian military sort of planning structure in because india is now moving towards an integrated battle group sort of structure but we don't know how much of information warfare is sort of uh, as a requirement how important information warfare is seen but it is very important because if you look at the russia ukraine war 
anybody with half a brain will tell you that Russia is winning the war on the ground. It's doing a bad job, but it is winning the war. It's pounding cities into the Stone Age. It's leveling entire cities and it's capturing vast swaths of territory. But if you look at social media, you think Ukraine is winning. From day one, the narrative is that Ukraine is blowing up tanks, it's taking prisoners, it's, it's, it's capturing artillery. So Ukraine is very clearly winning the information war. And I think that uh, in, in information warfare, China is a huge leap ahead of India. And India hasn't really come to the come to the playing field yet. We're still not, we're not fully understood and, and respected the need for an information warfare campaign. But that is, I would say, changing. And I think it's changing in the way we have started dealing with counterinsurgency in Jammu and Kashmir. Because what increasingly I see on Twitter is every time there's an encounter, and there's been an encounter now almost every day for the last few days, we're seeing the Russia rifles, the special operations group, the paras, uh, the, the CIS are actually posing around the dead bodies of terrorists and posting them and saying, because that is their version of information warfare, where, where they're sending it, to, where they're telling Pakistan or they're telling the ISI and their back proxies that look, your jihadists have the shelf life of a housefly at best 48, 72 hours. If you send them across the border, this is the state. So you're beginning to now see the germs or the ba basic protoplasms of an IW campaign in India's counterinsurgency approach. Now, whether that's going to be extrapolated to a conventional war with Pakistan or China is, is to be ascertained. So you beautifully um, explained how India can uh, you know, counter the uh, cyber warfare and the um, uh, spreading of disinformation that is being done by China. So what yes. about the uh, soft power influence that China is trying to um, in infiltrate India, uh, maybe through the language medium, Confucius, uh, you know, uh, studies, um, the whole idea of China. Uh, and even there were reports that, um, you know, in Bollywood, even China has a huge uh, influence in Bollywood itself. So how can India's, how can the people understand and how can India strategically counter in the soft power side of China's influence operations? I think what China has done very well in the US is something that they may be trying to replicate. See, what they, they may be trying to replicate in India. So what China has done in the US is that they have bought up a lot of film studios. In fact, the US's largest theater chain is owned by a Chinese parent. So what happens when you buy up, and, and the US is Hollywood, the Hollywood is, so if you control the kind of content in Hollywood films, then you are not just controlling what Hollywood shows the American population, you're controlling what Hollywood shows the world, right? Let me give an example. There's this movie called Top Gun, right? A uh, very famous Tom Cruise movie made in 1987, I think, it's the year I was born. And they made a sequel, which I think has come out this year. And uh, in 1987, the, the Paramount, I Paramount Pictures, I could be wrong. If you look at Tom Cruise's, his character's name is Maverick. If you look at his jacket, he has a patch of Taiwan, right? In 2022, the Taiwan patch is gone, essentially. So it's just these little things. It's, it's basically China buying up huge amount of influence in America by buying up film studios, by buying up, um, uh, what do you say, um, law firms, by buying up hotels, by buying up corporates, and exerting a huge amount of influence through American corporations. And what, what essentially, and where China has being successful very decisively is, 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 is in its hold over corporate America. You take Apple, for example. See, the US Congress wanted to pass a law that would, uh, what do you say, sanction individuals or they would criminalize a lot of the uh, uh, factories that were using slave labor, Uyghur slave labor in China to produce goods. And there was a fierce pushback from Silicon Valley. There was a fierce pushback against the bill by Apple because a lot of the components were again made in China. So what China has done fundamentally very well is that it has actually put a huge amount of pressure on these American corporates, which have a huge amount of influence on American policymakers, because ultimately American corporates provide the sort of PACs and super PAC funding that elect congressmen and senators. So there is a huge sort of uh, sec first order, second order, third order effect. Even take uh, fashion, for example, the world's largest supply of cotton comes from China and then second India. 
So by if, if China decides to turn the tap off on cotton, your H&M shirt or your Zara pant is going to get a lot more expensive. And that's the power of influence that China has through its trade, through its supply. Now, India is um, a lot, India is a different, uh, what do you say, a kettle of fish because Again, India has insulated itself fairly well in, in terms of its filmmaking, in terms of its uh, cultural productions, in terms of its art and so on and so forth. You don't see too much, uh, I have not seen any overt Chinese influence or Chinese money in Bollywood films or Tollywood films or, 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 or OTT platforms or whatever. This is funded, OTT is again funded by Netflix or Z5 or Amazon or the parent that's producing it. And, and, and Bollywood movies usually have very good local production or have got good tie-ups with the uh, uh, American production firms like Fox Star or, and so on and so forth. And Confucius Institutes have come under uh, the scanner around the world, not just in India, but around the world as, as a, a way of maliciously spreading Chinese propaganda and uh, spreading Chinese misinformation. So a lot of these, uh, I said, this is this, this sort of uh, emphasis on bringing these institutes under the scanner has, has sort of increased post Ladakh, post Galwan. Uh, again, I would say that India's vulnerabilities remain in tech uh, because a lot of Chinese companies are willing to set up subsidiaries in Singapore, uh, in other countries to be able to invest indirectly in Indian tech. And that remains a problem. Uh, India can, continues to be overly reliant on China for, as I said, pharmaceutical uh, raw materials, toys, a whole bunch of other uh, products that it can and should manufacture indigenously. And obviously not overnight, but maybe over a course of five to ten years. But this should have begun and what we should have started seeing is if uh, not an increase in, of, in trade in the trade imbalance but at least a flattening of trade and trade imbalance which we're not seeing so that trend is worrying again uh, india is a big country it can't be bullied as much as the smaller asian countries or the smaller africans latin american countries but there is a huge amount of influence and uh, the government needs to ask itself what it can do in a situation of war when it exports and imports seeds Right. And, and obviously those contingencies are being made and have been made. But unless we start to get a lot more uh, Atma Nirbhar, not just in our defense manufacturing, but our overall manufacturing, and un until the government is willing to look at a 10 year plan in where it enhances the PLI uh, schemes in manufacturing, reduces import tariffs, is willing to sort of, you know, take a huge cut in revenue for the greater good, then the influence will continue. Now, what the government's done very well is that it's launched very ambitious PLI schemes and incentives for semiconductor firms and is looking and is now in talks with Taiwan, the TSMC, to invest in, in, in India to, to manufacture uh, semiconductors and semiconductors around the world, essentially. So that's a good positive step. If the government is able to make that succeed and then emulate that for different sectors, then it's the start of something. So that's my take on it. So uh, coming to the last question. Um, in sure. the wake of the recent developments between Ukraine and Russia, uh, there yes. has been an increased fear uh, that the similar situation uh, that Ukraine faced, China will also face from China. Right. Uh, right. So, do you believe that uh, looking at the um, multi multilateral um, leverage that China has, the kind of influence it has um, in other countries through projects like BRI? Right. Do you believe that China uh, will will go that far, keeping in mind all these things? And... I think if China could, it would, but it's difficult. It's not a cakewalk as we've seen. See, let's understand that. Let's look, look at the genesis of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. The world was able to see the Russian army build up on Ukraine's borders for weeks. So there was no element of surprise. We were, they were able to see tanks, tactical battle groups, soldiers, uh, hospitals being erected, field hospitals being erected, supplies being transported with a great amount of clarity. So for China to launch an invasion, it can't do so without losing the element of surprise. There obviously has to be a huge buildup, not just in, 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 in tanks and troops and uh, other military equipment, but in terms of naval vessels, uh, landing craft, amphibious, amphibious landing craft, disproportionately large amounts of troop buildups, more for an exercise, basically, more than what you would technically use for an exercise. And this would be more, this buildup would be monitored for weeks. It's not something that can be done in a matter of days. It takes time. That's number one. So obviously they would lose the element of surprise. Now, number two, despite having a land border with Ukraine, and despite the Russians invading from 
Russia, from Crimea, from Belarus, from the sea, from, from four or five directions. What we've seen is an army without supply and logistics. No matter how many men you have, no matter how awesome and potent your firepower is, if you don't have your supply and logistics in place, your army is useless. Once it advances beyond a certain point, it gets bogged down. Morale goes out the window. And even the most, like, we, we kept seeing these reports of this 40-mile convoy heading to Kiev for days on CNN. Hundreds of vehicles. What happened? There was no fuel to supply a convoy of that size. And they ended up having to sort of leaguer for days on end. And Ukrainian civil drone operators rigged explosives onto commercial drones and drove them into these vehicles. They were just sitting ducks. So obviously, logistics and supply plays a huge factor. And for China to supply its troops, they would have to keep crossing the Taiwan Strait. It's not just simply landing off the troops and says, OK, now go do it. These troops need food. They need fuel. They need ammunition. They need more military equipment. They need spares. And all of that has to be transported by sea, which means that China has to first contend with the Taiwanese Navy, the Taiwanese Air Force, overwhelm them. And then after that, America will have to come into the America will most definitely have to come into the war and fulfill its obligations. Japan has likely said it, it will have to defend Taiwan because if Taiwan is captured, it, Taiwan acts as an unsinkable carrier for China's expansion into the China, into the East uh, sort of China Sea into the into the Singapore Giao Islands. So obviously, Japan has every incentive to join the battle, at least from a naval standpoint. So the Chinese will not just be contending with the Taiwanese Navy and the Taiwanese Air Force, but also the US Navy, the US Air Force, which is the largest and most powerful Air Force in the world, and the second largest, but still the most powerful Navy in the world. People think that just because the Chinese have more ships and they are the largest Navy, it's a powerful Navy. It's not the US capabilities, 11 carrier battle groups, right? And, they've got, and, 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 and battle groups that can travel thousands of miles without support from home, halfway across the world. China does not have that full blue water capability yet. It has enough boats and ships to patrol its uh, claims in the East China Sea, South China Sea. But that's as far as it goes. To be actually able to take on the US Navy, which is known for projecting power over a large distance over the Indo-Pacific, is not going to be easy. You can talk about your Dongfang 31 carrier killer missiles and you can have all of that, but it's not going to be easy taking on the most powerful Navy in the world. And you need to make sure that the Taiwan Strait is demined and clear for your supply ships to keep replenishing your troops on Taiwan as they try to capture the island. And those tankers are, are going to be sitting ducks as they cross the straits because the US will have long range strike capabilities, which means that China will then have to target, maybe target the US bases in the Pacific, in Guam with missiles, with ships, maybe with an invading force, bringing it directly into conflict. So China risks enlarging the conflict to protect its supply routes in the Taiwan Straits. And the, the Taiwanese have also got a very potent, uh, and are actually doubling down on their, uh, what do you say, ballistic missile capability. So China will face a disproportionate missile barrage across the Straits. If, if, if any victory over Taiwan is going to come, if at all, is going to come up with a, at a huge price, at a very, very costly price. And please understand that Xi Jinping has already tied off a fair chunk of troops in the Indian border with supplies and logistics that he's not able to free because we have matched, the India has matched these troops man to man, tank to tank, artillery piece to artillery piece, right? So it's not easy. He cannot just wake up and say, okay, the, the Taiwan front is not going, going so well. I'm going to pull 20,000 troops from Ladakh, de acclimatize them, and put them on a boat. It's just not possible. He's basically opened up another front. So, um, it is difficult. The logistic challenges are huge. China does not have ample anti-submarine warfare capability yet. It's still not developed that as it, as it should. Even uh, amphibious landing uh, capabilities to land such a large force is not fully developed. They're working on it. They're some years away, but they're not fully developed yet. So that means that they would have to commission a lot of private transports and private charters, private tankers to actually land these troops. So it would be a bit of a hodgepodge. Uh, so, so there are severe logistic challenges and, and I think that the way that they have watched the Ukrainians defend their homeland, they will see that the Taiwanese will also fight very stubbornly. They are not going to yield an inch. Uh, every inch of land yielded will come at a huge cost. And Taiwan has spent the last so many decades preparing itself for an invasion on the mainland. They have basically rigged their beaches to catch fire on troop landings. They, 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 the beaches are, are, have been rigged to be turned into infernos burning thousands of troops as they land. They have excellent, uh, what do you say, shore-based defenses, uh, uh, beachheads, that kind of thing. 
So it's not going to be a piece of cake. They've spent the last so many decades preparing for a Chinese invasion, and it's going to be a very bloody invasion, long drawn out invasion. And uh, uh, victory may not be guaranteed. So any any attempt to take Taiwan militarily is going to be fought with huge risk. I think what China is pursuing is a long term isolation of Taiwan diplomatically. There's only maybe 13, 14 or 15 countries right now that recognize Taiwan diplomatically. China may be trying to get these will try to get these countries to to not declare to not recognize Taiwan, but to recognize China. China is also going after Taiwan in multilateral institutions. The way it barred uh, Taiwan from appearing on any WHO related forums during COVID-19. So I would say that China understands that maybe assimilating through force may not be possible, but maybe isolating Taiwan to a point where it has no choice but to form extreme economic linkages with. China for its dependence, that may be the ultimate stated goal. And that is certainly achievable over the next 20, 30 years. You know, if China is persistent in its diplomacy and it's persistent in its policy. So what we're looking at is not so much a, a physical grabbing of land, but maybe an economic sort of uh, capture of, of, of Taiwan, which is what I think. Or Xi Jinping may decide there's too much political turmoil at home and start a war. Could be. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but only time will tell. So as we have reached the end of a very insightful uh, session, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tanvi Jankishan, for explaining the whole concept of uh, influence operation and the ones that are carried out by China across the world um, yes. in a very comprehensive and a very insightful manner. Uh, I am yes. sure that the listeners have gained a deeper understanding uh, of yes. the topic and this discussion would have helped them to uh, identify and analyze um, such matters if they come across in uh, in the future. Now I would Happy like to, yeah. So I would like to place my sincere gratitude and appreciation to you, Mr. Tanvi Jaikishan, for taking out time uh, from your busy schedule and sharing your knowledge and understanding to the listeners uh, from the entire team of C3S. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Sapna, for having me. Have a lovely Sunday afternoon. And uh, if there's anything, please do reach out. Um, now, um, I would also like to express my sincere thanks to all those who are listening to the C3S podcast um, on Chinese influence operations, and we hope you had a very insightful discussion. I take this opportunity to extend thanks to our Director General, Commodore Aris Vasan, and Executive Director, Commodore Vijesh Kumar Garg, um, for, for this opportunity and the constant encouragement given to the team C3S. Um, I would also like to extend a sincere thanks to the distinguished members of C3S in supporting uh, the activities and being taking part in every event that is being organized by uh, C3S. Um, last but not the least, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to my senior research officer, um, Mr. Balasubramanian C, and my colleague, uh, Mr. R. Patmesh Chari, for all the help and support that they have rendered to me and C3S. Thank you all for listening and we look forward to bringing to you many more discussions. Till then, stay tuned for more informative discussions from C3S. Thank you.